In the name of Jesus, I bring under arrest. I know the enemy wants to hinder. He wants to stop the flow, but he cannot. We bring that attack under arrest in Jesus' name. And God, we give you glory, honor, and praise. Could we give the Lord a mighty shout of praise like you know he deserves? Now listen, as you're seated today, the wheels are getting loose. And I want to tell you, I'm, I've identified four wheels. Here's, here's wheel number one. It is when your passion for Jesus gets loose. You're in trouble. It's not going to be good for you. Now, if you've ever loved Jesus Christ, if you've ever served him more, if you've ever been more enthused, if you've ever been closer to him, at any point in your life than you are today, the wheels are getting loose. You are in a backslidden state. If you can ever record in your history, looking back, as I remember back then how close I was to the Lord, and I'm not there now, you are not where you need to be. The wheels are getting loose in your life, and you will go nowhere. The second wheel I want to identify is when the power over your own attitude gets loose. You're the only one who can fix that issue in your life, your spirit, your attitude, the way you treat people, the way you look at life, the way you approach Jesus, the way uh, you have motives for doing certain things. You're, you're, when you don't control your own spirit, you are about to find the sea closing in on you. Thirdly, I said last week, when you lose potential, I talk, talked about Gehazi, Elijah. Elijah did 16 miracles. His servant Elisha did 32 miracles. Could the next servant Gehazi do 64 miracles? Was that what God had in mind to do great things to this man? But he wasted and squandered every opportunity and every chance and every potential. Rather than going down in history as a great prophet, leprosy clung to him the rest of his life. And all of his descendants were born lepers because of a man who wasted his potential. Now Jesus deals with wheel number four. It is when your priorities get loose. Now priorities simply put is what order is important and what order things in your life will be. What will be number one? What will be second? What will be third, 11, 12, 45? In what order do you assign the various things and opportunities and responsibilities in your life? Now, when Jesus talked about Pastor Dylan talked about the sparrow falling and how much he must love us. It's over in Matthew 6, this wonderful chapter. And Jesus talks about things like, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also, verse 21. And he begins to say, everyone in the world worries about what they're going to wear, what they're going to eat, worry about tomorrow. But as my people, you don't need to worry about those temporary things because I'm going to take care of you. But I'm, how many know God provides and God supplies? He is Jehovah El Shaddai. He's the God of plenty. You know, there's no lack. God's not up there wondering about, about the, the heaven having a recession heaven having a depression, uh, about what the stock market's doing in heaven. God never has one moment when he runs out of anything. Hallelujah. Yeah, he's full of mercy, grace. He's got everything he needs, and he, and he wants to supply your needs. But it is, it is contingent on one thing. Jesus didn't say, look, I want everybody to know I'm just going to take care of everything for you. And there is that Lucy kind of gracie thing out there that says, Oh, look, you just, because you, you're so wonderful, special, cute, and sweet, God's just going to open up the heavens, and you're never going to have any lack. You're never going to have any need. No, it is contingent on one reality. It's a decision that you and I must make every day of our lives. If, he said, if you seek me, not second, not third, not even one B, but if you seek me first, now, I, I gave you this study years ago, and it's really complicated, but I'll break it down for you in case you forgot what first means. First means first. It is.
is nothing that we need to make a, a study on too long. First doesn't mean second. It doesn't mean uh, 1B. First means first. First is where you start. First means above everything else. Of all the hats you wear, the first responsibility you have is to love Jesus Christ. When, when the Lord was asked, hey, what's the most important commandment? He says over Mark 12, 30, he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. When Moses moved upon Mount Sinai to hear the command from God, the very first thing out of God's mouth was a message of priority. You will have no other gods before me. Seek me first. You think about priorities. You think about the order. You think about what's moving in your life. Priorities are what you give life to. There is a practice that we are firmly against called euthanasia. It is when we choose when someone will live or die. And the reality is we must commit spiritual euthanasia and we must speak death to everything that's attacking priority one. And then we've got to breathe life into priority one. We have got to say everything that's secondary, you get off the throne. You are not controlling my life. You are not the one that's moving me. You're not the one I answer to. I'm not going to give my life over to what's third, fourth, and fifth. I'll give it some attention, but it won't get the focus of number one. Seek me first. Is Jesus first in your life? The most important question you'll ever, ever have to ask and answer is, is Jesus first? Priorities are seen in a couple criteria, what you think about. All the hours you're awake this week, how many of those hours and how many of those moments was spent in contemplation and meditation and thought, and prayer, and listening, and communing, and fellowshipping with Jesus. He is not something that you can throw in a slot at 1030 on Sunday morning and forget about him the rest of the week and put him back in the next Sunday morning at 1030 and act like you're serving the Lord. What the most important thing is, is what do you think about? Secondly, what do you spend your time on. Huh. You have a certain set hours in the day. How many of those hours are given to other things? And Jesus is somewhere, well, if we have time and if we have time to get everything else done. And let me just make this clear. A lot of people have this viewpoint of attending God's house. If I don't have something better to do and if my schedule permits... And if it works out, and if, you know, uh, the weather's good and everything comes together, then, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. I'll try to be in God's house. You ask people who are faithful to God's house, you'd be surprised. Some of them come to God's house eight or nine times a year. When there's over 150 service opportunities to get there, and if you ask them, they would say, that's my church, that's my pastor, and I'm pretty faithful. But based on what criteria of priority is, you're just lying to yourself. The reality is, if you don't think about it, and if you don't spend time on it, it's not a priority. And if you don't spend net, now here, hey, hey, everybody say, preach. You don't spend money on it. Deer hunting is not a priority for me, and I, and I don't mind folks hunting deer. I went to a guy's house one time, not from this church, and I, I will never forget what I saw. I must have seen a hundred or 120 big brown eyes staring at me. He said, come to my man cave. And I mean, there were more deer heads than a bag of M&Ms has M&Ms. Come on. I mean, all over the place. And, and, and I said, I'm, I'm, com I'm coming to invite you to church. And I thought, I just about said the stupidest thing I've ever said. And I said some dumb things. But it hit me right there. This guy ain't coming to church. He's got bigger and better things to do. 
Uh huh. Went to a place one time, invited a guy to church, and he had a wall full of trophies on his favorite sport. And it was, I, I said, I come and invite you to church. And I thought, waste, don't waste your time because he ain't coming because it's not important to him. You know, there's a group of people that I believe that being in God's house on Sunday morning on November 15th, 2015, I believe there's a group of people that, that felt that that was a priority. And it's not the folks that aren't here. It's you. Because you're here. You're here. And there are people that don't mind dishing out and poning up all day long for what's important to them. And when you fall in love with something, your money follows that. Wherever your heart is, there your treasure be also. And I've heard people all along the ministry, all the years that I've preached, the prosperity, success, giving, financially, putting God first, tithe and offering message. I've heard every loophole, every excuse in a book. And they don't like me, but they'll walk out and get in a beautiful, shiny car. And they'll have a great home with all their hobbies and all their things fully funded. Fully funded. But the problem is they uh, choose to attack the message or the messenger because it is about priorities. It's about what will be important in my life. Here's another question to ask. What do you assign value to? What do you assign worth to? What do you say that is highly valuable in my life? That is something that's very important in my life. That is something that I esteem, I think about, I give my life to, I give my worship to. What will you fight for is a question to ask. What do you roll your sleeves up about? Let me just make this very clear. We always talk about, I know if I ask you what will you fight for, everybody's going to say my family. Ever? Oh, yeah, yeah, and I will too. You know, we all go, we roll our sleeves up. You know, I'm just going to tell you, and I know you all know this, and I, I, I'm, you're on board with me, but you don't mess with the, with the red head. Come on. I had to look over and make sure it's still red because it changes every few minutes. Oh, come on. She is like the Apostle Paul. I die daily. Come on. Is that, that's a compliment. I'm saying that in a nice way. Don't awe me. Come on now. Whose side are you on, hers or mine? <laughs> what a dumb question. But you don't, you know, I, I listen, I, 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 see, uh, I see people mess with families, and, and, and I think, you, I, if you is a lighthouse, my lighthouse folks won't let you, won't put up with that. They're not going to tolerate that for one second. And I just want to tell you something. Nehemiah 4.14 says to fight for your families. If you, if you have a burglar or you have a, 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 a rabid dog move into your house, uh, try to eat your children, you're going to shoot that dog. Listen, I love dogs, but he ain't eating my kids. He's not eating my grandkids. I mean, he's going to have, I mean, I'm going to send him back to the earth from which he came. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. That's what I'm going to do. Now, I'm not a good shot. He's going to have to get close. <laughs> Come on. I'm going to have to dangle a hot dog or something in front of him and then pop him. Because I can't, he has to be within five feet, but, you know, he's going down. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Come on. You got, a, you got a coyote in the yard? You got a, a mean bear in the yard? Come on. You got some try to take your family? You got sickness? You got flu? You do everything you can to keep your family well. Come on now. You fight for them. But what about their spiritual eternal souls? We need to roll our spiritual sleeves up and fight for our youngins. Come on, our children, our babies. Because there's a devil like a lion roaring, seeking whom he may devour. Uh-huh. So I want to tell you today, you're going to put your mind for a moment on what's important. And you're going to be honest about it. You're going to examine your priorities because in a world that the wheels are coming off, it's easy to see they've got things all confused. What is minor, they major on. What is major, they minor on. What should be valuable, 
you know, that it is, it, and it, I'm going to tell you when it began, when Roe versus Wade back in 1972, when a Supreme Court all of a sudden said, you can kill your baby at will, and there will be no consequences. You can just have as many, and bill, I mean millions and millions and millions of children. We started devaluing life. And life is no longer precious. Life is no longer sacred. I mean, the average child will watch 16,000 murders by the time they get into junior high on their television screen. And we, we, we allow Hollywood, we allow the gaming industry, we allow all of these uh, folks that do not know God. We bring that stuff, we purchase that stuff, we put it in our home, and all of a sudden, life is not valuable. We just, you, you know, we just can spray bullets out in a crowd. And, you know, I'm going to tell you something about some of those guys that did that. They probably went to sleep and slept like a baby all night long. They are, have a seared conscience. They are reprobate. They are apostate. They are past the point of no return, some of them. I'm just telling you. Could they get saved? They get saved, they call on Jesus. But there's nothing in their hearts that want to make them call on Jesus. And I, will, I hope they're found and I hope they're killed. <laughs> wow. Since, I just, since, when, since when do we not kill the bad guys? I mean, I want them to go to heaven, but they need to pay. Oh, come on, somebody. Marriage has been devalued. It is no longer the union between one man and one woman. We have watched the wheels come off. It is no longer a sacred thing. Marriage isn't sacred. Life isn't sacred. The house of God isn't sacred. The men of God aren't sacred. The name of Jesus aren't sacred. Nothing. And oh, at the same time, we have devalued what is important. We have built up and we have we have said we have built up mere mortals and we have said to them we will worship you we will we will support you we will fund you we will praise you you are a man the the creation the creation is being worshiped more than the creator come on and one more thing as the wheels are coming off I'm going to ask you a question. Didn't Paul prophesy that in the last days there would be perilous times? The times are getting rough. And I will just tell you, it is very, very disconcerting that we are watching our world unravel. And a lot of people aren't stepping into God any more than they did a few years ago. But the Bible says the nearer you see is coming, approaching you need to draw near to him. You need to draw nigh to him. You need to get hungry for him. You need to get more faithful to him. You need to get your priorities right. Amen, somebody. Could you jump your feet and say, my priorities are going to get right. I'm going to get it right. I'm going to set it in order. I'm going to do this. Hallelujah. Answer a couple questions. You say, well, Pastor, how do I set my priorities? Since you ask, I'm going to tell you. you got to answer a couple questions. In other words, your priorities are set on these criteria. Write them down. Number one, here, here it is. What's God's Word say about it? If God's Word says it's important, it's important. If God's Word said it's not important, it's not important. This Word is important. Now, i got everyone's attention. Now, listen to me. I don't know what you did last Monday morning. I don't know. But if you're really hearing me preach today, if you're really hearing me, if you're under the sound of my voice, and you understand that the Holy Spirit has you here under divine assignment, I don't know what you did last Monday morning, but some of you, you wasn't in this word last Monday morning. And you know why you wasn't? Because it wasn't priority. I learned a long time ago, if it's important to you, you'll figure out how to get it done. And you know, I know people that say, well, you know, I, I'm not a huge reader. Listen, there's a lot of ways around that. You can get it on CD. You can get it on your iTunes. 
I almost said you can get it on tape, but see how I'm advancing? Because I know no one has tapes no more. I about said you can get it on a cassette series. And everybody looked at me like, well, who what? You can get it, you can get it, you can listen to it. You can put it in your place of prayer, and you can listen to the word. You can put it in uh, on your way to work. You can consume the word. But I'm saying to everybody, it's time the word gets important. It's time that we spend time every day in God's eternal word. If I ask you a question, 50% of you could not raise your hands. Half of you did not read your word this week at any degree of regularity. It's time to change that. I'm commanding you to fix that. I'm telling as your pastor in the authority that God's given me, as your spiritual father, it's time to get your report card up. We settled for D's and F's. It's time to start moving the report card upward. Come on. So all of you who did not read your word tomorrow morning, I pray you're haunted all night long if you don't determine today. And let me tell you something about priorities. You don't wait till the, the moment you have to figure it out to figure out what's important. Those got to be figured out in advance. They got to be predetermined. They got to be preset. Come on, church. And then you are going to spend time in prayer. I've, I've asked a lot of people that are backsliding. Do you pray? Yeah, of course. There's never anyone who doesn't pray. How about your word? Oh, well, I haven't been reading your word, word very much. But you know what they say? They're thinking, yeah, I pray. I say, God, help me. God, uh, Jesus, take the wheel. Come on. Uh, uh, help. Bless this food, Lord. And listen, that's not praying. Praying is spending time with God. You say, well, God is important. He's priority one, and you don't pray? You don't seek your face, his face? No, you're kidding yourself. And I pray for conviction. I've been asking all night long, God, I pray some people get convicted. Now, conviction doesn't make you feel bad and just feel bad. Conviction makes you feel bad enough that you want to get it fixed. I pray some of you get under conviction this morning. You know what? You, you know the church takes off and the church grows? When we pray and when we read, not on Sundays, but on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And when people have a walk with God, it's not all about what happens in the service on Sunday at Lighthouse. It's got to be, it's got to be what's going on in the week in your home, in your time with the Lord. And it's got to become a priority. It's got to be, God's Word says it's got to be the priority. So God's Word says He is the priority in our life. He is number one. And he's not number one if you don't spend time with him. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. The word, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He is his word. And when we don't have a love for the word, when we don't, you know, I've been preaching good for a long time. And I always get little bump fuzzle. When someone can just act so blasé, about the preaching of the word. And it's like, you know, but you give them a coupon where they can save 50 cents at Burger King and they're all fired up. To try to get them excited about the word, well, they got a nap to take. God takes his word personally. He takes his house personally. And the wheels are coming off in this old nasty world. And the only place that's going to be found moving forward is the church of the living God. Everybody else is bogging down and don't know what to do. But the house of God will keep on going. The gates of hell will not prevail against us. The kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent keep moving and advancing. We are going forward. So here's how you set your priorities. First of all, raise your hand if you're receiving this word real good. Raise your hand if you need this word real good. Raise your hand if you're going to do something about this word real good. Because hearing it does very little. You've got to do it. You deceive yourselves if you just hear it and you don't do it. I am saying, I am saying right now, look, I don't say this kind of stuff very often and I'm not saying it lightly. But if you need a wake-up call, you come and give me your number. 
and what time you need call. And I will wake you. I will personally call you and say it won't be the recorded call them all message. Hey, this is Pastor here calling and tell you I'm excited about this weekend. It'll be Joe, get your excited rear end out of bed. It's time to read the word. And it's going to bling, bling, bling. You're going to look over, and it's going to be me, and you're saying, Dear God, I had to be outside my mind to hand that man my number. Tell him to call me. Because, listen, big dog always keeps his word. You need to know that. If I say I'm calling you, I'm calling you. And when you call me, I'm answering. I ain't like some people. Come on. If you need me to call you tomorrow, half hour before you get up, we'll do that. It's that important. And if you, if you want to pull a trick on me and say, I'll get you real early. Yeah, I don't care. You can get me up 432. It doesn't matter. I love God's word, and I want to see you start getting God's word. Get God's word going on in your life and your spirit. If it's three verses, if it's just praying and saying, God, do something in me today. Bless me with victory today. I'm tired of being mediocre. I'm tired of being average. Set a fire on me today. Hallelujah. God, do something new in me today. Yeah. I'm not going to stay the same. I'm not going back. Get hungry. Church, can I preach as hard as I possibly can? This week, you are going to read your Bible, and you're going to pray every day, and you're going to seek God's face, and you're going to meditate, and you're going to listen, and you're going to do what he tells you to do. But you, I promise you, I will guarantee you, I'll give your tithe back. If you pray and read your Bible every day this week, you won't walk in here with new confidence, with new zeal, with new authority, with new victory. Your faith won't rise to a high level. You'll be ready to storm hell with a squirt gun because God's word gets in you and it's powerful and it's sharper and it's quicker than any two-edged sword. Hallelujah. And it will do a work in your life. you got to devour it. you got to consume it. you got to read it. you got to fall in love with it. It's got to be priority. That's what he says about it. Now, he has a lot of things to say about other stuff. But you got to get, listen, I decided this a long time ago. I don't have to worry about me or my family or you. If number one's in place, everything else always follows. Yeah. You'll spend the right time on, there's nothing wrong with hobbies and deer hunting and playing your sports. There's nothing wrong with watching a football game on occasion. Praise God. In name, the name of Jesus, highly praised about that. Hallelujah. There's nothing wrong with spending time with your kids. There's nothing wrong with taking a nap. There's nothing wrong with being lazy once in a while. There's nothing wrong with riding your bike. There's nothing wrong with going out to eat and having fun with your friends. None of those things is nothing. There's nothing. There's not. A, you, are you all sitting down? There's not. A, are you all sitting down? Am I going to say this? It is not even a sin in Facebook. You don't even. You, but if you. Oh, it's the big one. <laughs> if you're smart with it and you're balanced with it. And, and you're not addicted to it. I will just tell you this. You, you, you're allowed to have one addiction. Allowed to have one addiction. That's to Jesus. That's the only healthy addiction. Only healthy addiction. All other addictions are sin. And will make you sick. And will destroy you. So what does God's word say about it? Here's another thing to think about. Is it temporary? Is it lasting? What's so important to me? that I value so high, i got to say, is it going to flee away? Is it like the grass that burns and is gone? Is it dust in the wind? Or is it eternal? We keep our eyes on the eternal. The temporary things have a, a death sentence on them. All the things that we are value so much, all the things that we hold so dear, if they're not going to heaven with us, then they're not that important. And there's room for all those things. I'm not putting anybody on a guilt trip about having a lot of fun. I have a great hobby. I enjoy a lot. There's months I don't get to my shop, but I love getting in my shop and making things. There's times I, and, and there are just times I can't get in there. But my point is, there's nothing wrong. With, and I love being with my wife. I love being around our friends and our family and spending time doing the things I want to do. But 
you can do those things without guilt if you know Christ is first. If you know it's like spending money, if I've tithed and given God what is his, I can go buy me something without guilt. But if you're a non-tither and you go to spend money on yourself, I hope the thing breaks. I hope all the frillies on those $80 jeans just frill right off. I said before, but it, listen, if you're not a rock star, you don't need no $200 jeans. Walmart has them for $21.99. Come on now. Come on. And if you're, not a, if you're not an NBA basketball player, you don't need no $200 sneakers. Am I preaching real good to somebody? It's, you got to figure out what's priority. I've had a guy fussing me for all. I, he fusses with me today if I saw him. He don't like me because I'm strong on tithing, but he drives the nicest cars, the nicest home. It's a matter of what you love. I can tell you, you can have the best of both worlds. If you put God first, he will supply all your needs. We just read it. you got to get your, listen, priorities, priorities. I want you waking up tomorrow haunted with this word. What will be important to me? What is my priority? And if it's not going to go to heaven with me, I am not going to give a number one priority. And you, the only things that are going to heaven with you are the people with a living soul that have a heart and that have an opportunity to go to heaven or hell. Everything else is just gone. Come on. Now, thirdly, here's another question. If everything I claim is mine was taken, what would I miss the most? I saw a bumper sticker said, my, my wife took my dog and left me. Man, I miss my dog. <laughs> what, what if, what if, you think about Job? Job had, listen. If you read the first chapter of Job, everything, he's doing great. Chapter 2, everything begins to be taken in the storm. The thieves come in, and it's not until the guys come and report, now, Job, all your stuff is gone. Your property is gone. Your animals, your livestock, your wealth is gone. But they didn't stop. They've killed all your kids. The Bible says, then he shaved his head and rent his garment and put on sackcloth and ash it was it wasn't the losing the property that caused him to go in the morning come on it wasn't the losing let me tell you something i've been around people at church that thought they've lost their cell phone at church and i just wish i could get the urgency and the panic over the lost and dying people going to hell well this is good preaching in this town as i would get that panic and urgency about dear god i lost my phone hold the presses stop everything the world must come to a screeching halt i can't live without my uh, c6 What am I going to do? I will tell you something about your phone, about your computer, about all the stuff a lot of people are living for today. There's been a lot of people that went to heaven without any of those things. But there's going to be a lot of people go to hell because of them. Since... April the 9th of 1992, my dad's been healthy and dancing on streets of gold. He never one time had a cell phone. Think of that. And he was happier than almost anyone I ever met. And I want to tell you something. We've getting, we getting everything all, all out of whack. What will you miss the most? I mean, it's terrible that you've lost something. But don't get so concerned that you forget you're in a lost world and people are dying without Christ. That's what's important. We need to miss that. We need to understand if everything was gone and I had just a couple of things left, what would I want left? And if your answer is anything but Jesus and my family, your priorities are wrong. Number four. If I knew I only had a short time left to live, would it be important to me? Mm, 
Mm, mm, mm, mm, mm. My mom told me of a Christian that she knows up in northern Indiana. That's Notre Dame country, as you know. And uh, this gal, I have a problem with this, and I'm gonna, and some of you may not totally agree, but let me let me. And you should agree because what I'm getting ready to say is is, is right. My mom said when I went to the went to the funeral, you know, a lot of believers, a lot of believers, they put in a casket, and I don't want to be morbid, but they put in a casket. And I like when a believer has a Bible in their hand. You know, I, 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 if 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 the Lord, I don't plan on ever dying, so don't get excited. But I I I wouldn't care if. My wife, when you walk up by me, and my wife has put a tithe envelope in my hand. I got one more crack at you. I have a grin on my face doing this. I'll be wearing Malachi 3, 310, pay your tithes, come on. And my mom said, this gal's Christian, but her whole funeral was Notre Dame it was blue and gold and, and she had Notre Dame clothes on and Notre Dame uh, hat and necklaces and all of that and you know I said mom I said she goes that grieved me I said it grieves me because a Christian it's okay to be a sports fan but you don't want to be remembered because you had a you was a great fan you want to be remembered because you were a Jesus person Now listen to me. The wheels are coming off real fast in some of your worlds. And and we need to do something about the priorities in our life. Church, if you're disobeying this word, if you're living a lifestyle that is contrary to this word, If you're living a lifestyle that you know is against the word, you are in rebellion to this word, what are you doing? You're playing and messing with your eternal soul. And nothing, nothing about that is funny. Nothing about that needs to be put off. <clears throat> There's nothing about that needs to be procrastinated about. If there are things in your life that are not priority, tomorrow's not the day to get it fixed. If Jesus Christ is not the center of your world, if he's not the Lord of your life, if he's not the reason you live, it is time to get that problem There's a large percentage of you today, and you know how deeply I love all of you. But if you don't respond to this altar call, the devil will be really happy about that. Because there's a large percentage of you need to courageously say, my priorities need fixed. There's a bunch of you. How do I know? Because I'm preaching this word today, and you're here. That's how I know. And this word wasn't for the other guy. It wasn't for somebody else. It was for you. Do you think that 118 people thought the last thing they're going to do, good to see you, Tanner Blevins, the last thing they're going to do is go to some concert? You think, you think that they're in Paris, they're going to concert? You think they may have had plans for after the show, for the next day, for the next week, for the next month? Some of them had a year, uh, five-year goals. Some of them had a long-term plan. Do you think they walked in and scanned their ticket and went through that turnbuckle and went to their seat and started listening to that music thinking the bad guys are going to walk on the platform and they're going to spray bullets and kill us? No. The rich man walked out and said, what am I going to do with all my riches? Oh, I know 
what I'll do. I'll tear down these barns and I'll build bigger barns. And Jesus said, you fool. Tonight your soul will be required of you. Hezekiah found out he had a short time to live and the word of God came and said, set your house in order. We got to get an order right. We've got to get the order right. Jesus Christ must be first. More important than anyone or anything in this world. And if he isn't, this is the greatest day you've ever come to church because you have a chance to get that straightened out. Hallelujah. Jump your feet and give the Lord some praise right now. My God. You Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Now I prophesy. I prophesy. If you don't heed this warning, wheels are going to come off in your life. And it won't be good for you. And I, God loves you so much. We love you so much. Today's your day. Bow your heads. Close your eyes, please. How many can honestly say by the uplifted hand? No doubt in my mind that Jesus Christ is my number one priority. Before you raise it, no doubt in my mind he's the number one priority based on the time I spend, the way I spend my money, the way I think, what's important, what I deem as valuable, what I fight for, what I would die for based on the criteria you just talked about. These aren't just words, but everyone in my life, there'd be no one surprised at me raising my hand here because they see how I spend my time. They see how I spend my energy, and it's toward Jesus. He is Lord. Based on that criteria, can you honestly raise your hand and say, He's first in my life? If that's you, put your hand up. So if your hand isn't raised, I want you to step out wherever you're at and walk down here fast. You're the only one who can fix it. You're the only one who can fix it. You're the only one who can fix it. You're the only one who can do anything about it. If you haven't read your word at least five out of seven days the last week, you need to be down here. If you don't pray, oh, come on now. If you don't pray every day, you need to, you don't spend time with the Lord every day, this is your day. It's your day. It's your day for victory. Is Jesus worth being first? Because that ball team, that hobby, your family, those things did not die on the cruel cross for you. He did. Only he did. I feel the Holy Ghost wind now moving this house move in this house I'm going to wait a few minutes I'm going to wait a moment We'll close with some announcements and an offering and talk about a few things for our church. I want to just say this to all of you. Look, I'm revved up. I'm fired up. Something's tapped into you today that brought you here. But if it was responding to me or some pressure I exerted over you, it won't last. Why you came down here has got to be a deep remorse and a regret in your heart that you know Christ has not been the center. That's why you've got to be here. You've got to be here because you feel like you betrayed Jesus. And you're deeply sorry for that. And you've got to be here because you're ready to change your behavior. Not just an emotional moment, but a real change of attitude and behavior. 
Are you willing? Look up here at me. All, the, all of you folks that have come, are you willing to roll up your sleeves, to push secondary things down, and say, Jesus, I'm surfacing you as the Lord of my life. I'm putting you back on the throne in my heart. You're going to be the center of my world. I am not going to exalt anything ever again above you. I'm not going to place my will, my plans, my hopes, my life above you. What I want will never be above you. I will not commit idolatry. You will be the, you will be the only one I worship. Are you willing to really make that commitment? It's a deep commitment, but it's one that is deeply rewarding and deeply satisfying. And it will bring, I'm telling you, you get up and behave a little different tomorrow as far as, as, far as how you start your day. You get that word out. You get your worship music out. You just say, Jesus, I love you. Don't get fancy. Don't pray to impress anybody. Say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. I'm telling you, there's going to be a quick lift. The wind's going to catch your sails, and you're going to take off. I'm prophesying. Pastor Dylan is singing this song, and while he does, let's everybody in this place examine our own hearts. You know, I know there are folks that are standing out there, and I love you all so much. I'm mad at nobody. If Jesus comes right now, would this sanctuary totally empty out? It's going to happen just that quick someday soon. Would you be the one taken or the one left behind? Church, don't let the devil steal this opportunity. Don't let the devil rip you off. You say, well, Pastor, I know, I know, I know I need to be at that altar. I really know I need to. And as this song is being ministered, I want you to come and stand. But everyone, let's just lift up our hearts. Raise your spirits. Raise your hands to Jesus. Let him minister. I feel the Holy Ghost moving in hearts. How many of you at this altar... You will raise your hand as a sincere promise to God that things are going to change. Come on. Raise it high. Raise it high. Otherwise, it's just been emotion. If you, don't go, if you don't go home and fix some things, you a quick example of how commitment and love works. If I go home this afternoon and my beautiful wife says, honey, I really don't like it when you refer to me as the redhead. I don't expect that to happen because she's put up with it for all these years. But if she said to me, uh, please, please, that hurts me. And I say, oh, baby, sweetie, honey. I'm so deeply sorry for that. I'm sorry it hurts you. I didn't know it hurt you. But next Sunday I say, don't honk off the redhead. Nothing changed. I said I was sorry. But the message to her is, you're not sorry. You didn't change anything. You didn't change anything. You told me you were sorry, but you kept on behaving like you was. So tomorrow, if you don't get your word out, you can cry and you can say you're sorry, but if you don't get your word out and you don't pray, you don't get it with Jesus, it's just words. Jesus said, your lips say the right thing, but your hearts are far from me. Listen, church, we've got to have a change of heart. Lighthouse needs everybody to be on the same page that Jesus Christ is the center of our world. 
and I'll fix everything. I, I'll stop my lifestyle. I'll change. I'll, 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 I'll stop my behavior. I'll, I'll change my thought. I'll change my language. I'll stop how I'm viewing life. I'm going to make a turn because he's first. I won't continue the same way. I love him that much. And I promise you, if my wife says it hurts me when you do that, I will do everything to the day I die to never do that again. Because I love her. Because I love her. How many of you would do that for me? If you knew a behavior was hurting me, you would change. Come on. All of you that don't tithe, see how I brought that in? I'm smarter than I look. You're hurting Jesus. You're saying, I don't trust you. I can't trust you with the first tenth. I'll have to figure it out for myself. No, it will never work. He's got to be God. You've got to trust him. And you can talk about all day long how he's first, but if you rob somebody, you don't love him all that much. <laughs> so today's a day. Everyone in this church has a chance to get this fixed. All right. I love you. Thanks for all four of you who responded. I knew you wasn't ready. I'll try it again. <clears throat> Everybody clear your throats. <clears throat> I love you. All right, let's give the Lord a shout of praise for the victories won today. It's been a great day.